Welcome everybody. Good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, dear viewer and listener. Welcome to this month's Startup Grind Luxembourg, where we have a very interesting fireside chat, as usual. First, a few words about Startup Grind. Startup Grind is the world's largest startup company, small business. Everybody, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever. Well, and that's why, sorry for that. Uh, and that's why Startup Grind believes in a few things. And Startup Grind has a mission. The mission is to educate companies everywhere in the world and to give them the opportunities they need to build, grow, and scale their companies. And they, we do it with assigning our values. We believe in making friends, not contacts. We believe in giving first, not taking. And we believe in helping others before helping yourself. This is all about startup grind. So we hope that today we can assist you in your endeavor, give you some insights and so on. And for those who are live there, you, we invite you to raise your comments, ask your question in the chat or by the Q&A function. And I will, during the fireside chat, pick them up and hand them over. So, but first uh, and last, and without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Michel Hoffman. Good morning. Hey, Steve. So, thank you for accepting the challenge, or the challenge, to give us the opportunity to have a chat with you. Uh, you are actually busy with uh, a venture called Giftable. What is Giftable in a nutshell, in a few words? Well, first off, uh, thank you very much, Steve, uh, for the challenge or for the opportunity to be talking to you today and to everybody listening around the world. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. I always uh, love talking, obviously, about what we do, but also to get to know new people. Um, so Giftable basically is an uh, ecosystem that um, fosters kindness. We want people to be kinder towards each other and we want to strengthening personal networks by, well, sending gifts. Um, I came across this quote uh, from 2011 from the Occupy Wall Street movement in the US uh, and I really love the quote. It, it basically goes along the lines of only joint creativity and gifts create intimacy and connection. And so that's basically what, what this is all about. And that's, uh, that's what we want to do and what we want to foster. Thank you. But Giftable is not your first experience. Before Giftable, you had one or the other experience. And very early on, I guess you were still a student or in the student area, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I must admit, I, I do actually have a very atypical kind of course of my life and also cause of my well, by now, I would say long career, uh, for that matter. Um, so if, if you want to, uh, I, can, I can definitely share some, uh, some insights here. Yes, so please. Basically, basically, what happened is um, I started my career really, really early on at the age of 15. So that's basically 14 years ago, right? Um, so what, what happened is I, I actually started working as a student a lot with an internet service provider, which ultimately got sold uh, much later on. Um, but doing this, um, well, I, I had another friend who wanted to, to start a company. And that company actually still exists. But I was one of the co-founders, uh, which was a creative agency, Gecko, um, still in Baton Rouge. It's, it's a small company. It has like three or four collaborators today. But it, it works well. And it was one of my very first endeavors as an, as an entrepreneur uh, to, to be fully responsible for that. Um, from there, there were several NGOs that I worked with, uh, the hackerspace, the very first hackerspace in Luxembourg at the time called Syndicate, today called Level Up, uh, where we actually brought together creative people uh, that were just, well, we call them hackers, but they are literally just using uh, what we know how to use in a different way, right? Um, and then in 2012, and that was the one you were mentioning when I was still um, in high school myself, a company called Individuum. Uh, Individuum was a, was a small platform um, which became rather big rather soonish um, from 2012 to 2017 where we helped about 13,000 uh, students to find their first job and or internship for that matter. So uh, that was um, a rather cool experience as well because while well, we started it off as students ourselves, we were five at the beginning, then obviously at some point we, we lost two of our co-founders 
who wanted to focus their time on studying. Um, and ultimately, we sold the company in 2017, which was uh, for us a great success, although it was not like the big deals that we read on TechCrunch about the hundreds and hundreds of millions. Um, but it was a lot of a lot of fun and actually learned a hell lot. Um, yeah, but you, I mean, uh, you uh, uh, at least you had an exit. That's always good. The other thing is, if we take this venture, Individuum, um, how did you go about it at that time? Was it fully virtual, fully online, or was there still some physical matching? Or how did it go? Because I remember at the time, and also even the the late noughties, the early 2000s, okay, you had a website, you could create groups, but in order to create a little bit more than news groups or chat groups, you needed to develop it a little bit yourself, either in PHP or whatever, what uh, you had at that time. And there, my question is, did you have all among the founders or did you need to go and look for it outside? So it's, it's a really good question. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, at that time, we had literally no idea what we were doing. So we, we, we figured it all out along the way, right? I mean, um, at the very beginning, given that we were five co-founders, we obviously had all our different uh, strengths uh, as well as weaknesses. Uh, and so at that time, I was uh, at the very, very beginning in charge of actually developing this platform. So as you were saying, um, in the early 2000s, you were talking all about like just putting people into groups and let them like chat or whatever. But we actually went a lot further than that already in 2012, 2013, where we basically developed an, um, a web application tracking system. So that meant really from sourcing a candidate, so you could be setting up your profile, and then based on that profile, we could be matching you with different employers and what they were looking for, et cetera, et cetera. But we actually didn't want to stop there because sourcing, well, that was known, right? You could do that already through a uh, job advert in the newspaper. You could be doing that through other platforms like jobs.lu, which became Monster, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we actually said, hey, what if we would let them or give them the opportunity to be, well, doing a live chat? And this live chat would be like the phone interview that you had at the time, right? And from there, and that was actually one of my proudest movement, uh, pr proudest moves with uh, individual was when we implemented uh, WebRTC. WebRTC at the time, was, well, WebRTC is Web Real-Time Communication Services. So that's basically what we are doing right now. You are sitting at the comfort of your home. I'm sitting at my home. And we can do this in a browser like Google Meet, et cetera, et cetera. And we were basically the first ones within at least Europe, I would say, that were able to come up through this alpha technology at that time uh, with a proper use case. And that allowed us to be accepted into the Google Launchpad program in London. So that was actually a big achievement and it was a lot of fun. We learned a hell lot as well. Okay. That is on the technical side a little bit, but I mean, okay. Of course, uh, in the beginning, you don't know what you, uh, you want to do. You feel, uh, you see a certain pain, a certain need, and then uh, you try to cover it, but you don't know how you're going to do it and how it will evolve and so on. But, okay, that's that one. But there are two parts of the equation. On the one hand, you have those looking for jobs or I don't know for traineeships and something like that and you need also those who are the ones with the power with the money those who offer these positions how did you go about it because uh, as you just said there had been job websites and they okay they didn't cover that niche 100 percent, but they covered it how did you go about that to convince those who had the positions to believe in you i mean to believe in the venture sorry for that yeah sure no um that's uh, it's a very very good question but ultimately it was all about the positioning of the platform so we really said hey we want to focus as students ourselves on the ones that are still at university or that have up to because we then at some point saw that we need to extend the market and the positioning itself um, up to like five years of experience so that that means we actually had this we created this blue ocean for ourselves where there weren't a lot of players and nobody actually really focused on those. Everybody was focusing on five years plus. And well, obviously, those are also the guys that at the time, and again, we are almost talking 10 years uh, later today, um, that, that were reading the newspaper and that were looking at 
the old way of doing it, right? And we were we were the the new frontier, the pioneers, sort of of bringing this into a into a way that students actually wanted to be in a position that employers would also reach out to them rather than them applying and not getting a reply and not knowing where they are in their status uh, on like mm -hmm. on the on the pipeline in in the recruitment software, et cetera, et cetera. And so we covered that. Um, obviously, as you just said, we had on the one hand side the students and on or, well first year professionals, and then on the other hand side we had the um, the employers, right, the ones with the power, as you just said. So basically, it's a two sided marketplace, and having a two sided marketplace, it's always about solving the chicken and the egg problem. So the sooner we um, actually realize that we only have value to an employer if we have enough candidates. Well, we knew that we needed to focus on the candidates and probably offer some smaller events or give them some training in terms of uh, how do I present myself properly? How do I reply to several questions, et cetera, et cetera. And by doing so, we had the candidates in our pool and we could actually, well, sell the candidates because that's what, that's what we've done, right? By using technology uh, to the employers. Okay, great. But uh, that is fine. And when came the time where it, was about money i mean where you stop we're starting to devise the pricing tiers the or the service tiers the service offering and the a way you could invoice when did that come did that happen also a little bit naturally or was there a specific moment where you well uh, yeah specific moment where you said okay oh now it would be nice to make it viable so um for us it, it's funny because we weren't necessarily in need of making money because we were all students and we were all still financed by our parents so that was an easy one to start off a business i would say um no but ultimately it really really changed when we got our first investors on board uh when it was really all about okay now it's about numbers and you need to be running the numbers and you need to be proving that this actually works out right um obviously you don't start a business uh, by not making money that's uh, that's the worst kind of business case you could be presenting. Um, so yeah, when 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 we had those three four investors in the early days, it was really like okay, we need to figure out how we can market this properly. Um, I I must say, we never really sold the big kind of contracts that you would that you would see like with a hat hunter of twenty five percent of the yearly salary or whatever. We had this subscription model where we said okay, for fifteen hundred a year or three thousand euros a year. You can be present on the platform. These are the slots, et cetera. Like the different tiers, as you just explained, that were defined. And we actually were quite successful at some point with that. Um, and obviously, it like for us, 1,500 euros at the time was a lot of money, right? But for the companies, the big tech players that we were, or the big players in general that we were working with, for them, it was like a marketing gig to a certain extent. Today, I can say that because now I have the, I, I stand back, I have a reflection point there, right? Um but yeah, so so that's how that's how we got there. It was a it was a transition from okay, we don't need to make money. We want to help other people to be finding their jobs. We know what we wanted to have to find a job for ourselves, and basically created that. And uh, when you evolved a little bit, I also the, I guess the tech, let's uh, I don't want to focus too much on technology, but there were a, a question coming in. But the thing is, it. I guess it also had to evolve from a quick and dirty one, uh, MVP style and so on, but if it, it breaks, shit happens, we do it quickly new, uh, to a little bit more stable because, when, as you said, when they're investors, when they're customers who are our clients, who are relying on you and even are paying you, um, how did, not, maybe not only technically, but also on the other parts of the venture, how did that evolve? Or, what impact did that have from having so, the fun side to a really run a, a business operational side? So, I mean, for us, it was still really, really difficult. So th this was not a conventional business. So replying to your question is really difficult as well, because while well, we were students, right? Um, but as we said, I love a good challenge. So <laughs> no, that, that being said, I mean, um, on the technical side of things, um, just to quickly cover that, uh, when the investors came in, uh, one of the investors who you most likely know, Xavier Buck, uh, obviously had his, his network of people behind him as well. So we had the super opportunity, to be, to be honest, 
that we could actually rely on his networks as well and the different companies that he was invested in in order to find the help uh, that was required. I remember specifically this one summer when uh, we actually hired uh, other students, friends of ours, uh, and we got an office space by another investor, which was unoccupied, that we could be using for the whole summer, right? And so for two, three months, two and a half months, we were working out of uh, well, Cloche d'Or at the Rue Guillaume Croll. I just remember that because it was the first office that we got, right? And we furnished it and it was a lot of fun. So that is when it really became sort of, this should be how you run a company. But then after the summer break, we all went back to school as well. So somewhat, we had a full-time employee at the time who's continued working, uh, who then ultimately went on to found another company, which you are well aware of in Luxembourg right now, Salonki. So that's also great to see that the people we worked with actually did great stuff afterwards as well. It was like, we, we come from the same breed sort of, right? Mm. And so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically how it went. And then when we actually graduated when we wanted to professionalize all of this we we did so mainly in luxembourg but also in london because one of the co-founders was actually studying and living in london and still is by the way um and we did most of our business particularly in london because while well, people in london are more forward thinking and more open to technology at least at the time mm-hmm. and um we actually the company sort of went rather bad, I want to call it, uh, when Brexit happened. So then we actually lost a lot of contracts because people didn't know anymore if they could be still recruiting people from across Europe, uh, which was obviously devastating. And that was the moment also we decided, okay, it would be a good idea now to find somebody who's willing to take the challenge over, take it to a different market or in the same markets for that matter. And that's how the exit came together. Okay, because uh, you already replied because the thing is, with an exit, it's always because you created it, even if it's fun, but it's yours. And then to let go, that's always the difficult part. And was it immediately, I mean, now giftable. The giftable idea or the concept, was it already, how shall I say, uh, growing in your mind, uh, during this period or did it come after and how did you come to the idea of giftable i mean uh, it's a very specific one uh, and not so common got it um no as a matter of fact uh, the idea actually came out of a completely different context and i'm happy to share that story with you as well um, probably just let, let's go back to 2017. 2017, we sold off the company. And I remember the day when we were sitting at the terrace at Tower 17. Um, my co-founder, co-founder and I smoking a cigar, by the way. Um, and we were basically, the both of us were happy because we just saw sort of the company declining due to Brexit. So we found the proper partner who basically now is doing a lot of business based off of what we created. And I'm super happy and, and, and proud for, uh, for that guy that, uh, well, ultimately you still have a particle of your DNA within that project as well, right? So it's, it's really cool to see them. Now, ultimately, uh, from there, I, I actually got recruited by, an, uh, by another agency, a design and UI UX focused uh, creative agency, where I was working with for about a year, a year and a half. So give or take, that, that, was the, that was the time frame. And so then I actually left the country and I moved to Berlin for about a year. Um, in Berlin, the, uh, the idea was to just do some consulting work to, well, living and breathing a different air than the Luxembourgish one. Given that, well, I went from high school to, well, two weeks at university when we got funding. So I dropped out. So I'm this classical college, college dropout founder. Um, so I went to Berlin to, to change, change of scenery. That was basically it. And uh, in December, when the decision was made that uh, so my girlfriend and I we would be coming back to, um, to Luxembourg, um, I was actually sitting there and I was wondering, what am I going to do with my life right now? Because it's, well, I mean, I'm coming back to Luxembourg. You have a network. That's cool. But do I want to go work for another boss, leader, whatever you want to call it? Or am I going to start up again? And so I remember vividly, Uh, In 2017, I actually said, okay, so that's my experience with entrepreneurship. I'm never going to start up again, at least not in Luxembourg. That was like my my thought, right? So we we went through several periods that actually were hell, right? It's it's not easy to be be an entrepreneur. 
And um, when I was sitting there in 2018, really thinking about what I would do, um, I was actually in a very bad place. I wasn't happy. Berlin wasn't the greatest experience. At the very beginning, I loved being anonymous. And all of a sudden, while you lose your social contacts, you don't know anyone really, uh, given that you were working for yourself, basically as a freelancer, you didn't get to know your coworkers. So you, I, like my social life was really uh, lacking all of it. And so I was wondering and coming back to all the videos and also the 2011 Occupy Wall Street movement and coming across this quote, and I was like, this is actually super beautiful and we could actually be doing something with that. And if we could show that people are generally good, kind and generous, if we can do something that's bigger than myself, ourselves, at the time it was myself, now I would say ourselves, but we could prove that people are good, then this is actually a real proper mission uh, and we could have a vision for that. And so I came to my, uh, to my whiteboard and I was just drawing up how could this work, what could this look like, etc. And while I was moving again from Berlin back to Luxembourg between January and April, give or take, um, I actually went to, went to see a couple of old friends, um, like, for example, Xavier as well. And I told him about it and I was like, what do you think? And I talked to other people about it. And basically, three out of four people immediately asked me, so how much, how much funding do you need in order to, take to, to get this off the ground? And I was like, this is great. It's not because of the funding, but it's because there are people actually believing that people are generally good and, uh, and generous, right? It's funny because I believe deeply that you actually have two camps here. You have the ones that actually believe that people are good, and you have the ones that say, you know, people are bad. Like, it depends on the experiences that we came across our lives, basically right and so um i said guys hold on a minute i need to like do a proper market research i need to come up with a concept etc etc and that's basically how it how it started out and so uh, by august 2019 we had the company created and we were up and running to go into development of the of the project okay when you say you had the company created that was you had the legal structure indeed uh, and uh uh, already the investors were in that legal structure or was that your shell with your co-founder co-founders and then you were afterwards including the shareholders uh, the, the investors how did you go about that so um we actually did it in a way given that we wanted to have a valuation immediately on the company and not only on the actual share price of uh, of the incorporation uh, so it was done in a way that we create right, we that, that I created the share company, but the investors already were standing behind it. And so basically uh, using their money to create a company and then reimbursing sort of the loan that they gave me into shares uh, in order to to be having a proper valuation uh, with, uh, with what we wanted to do in terms of the structure. Okay, and then okay, th you have the company created, but how did you go about it? Because you were not a student anymore. I mean, it was okay. It was still fun. It should be fun unless the business is hard. But I mean, you had also pe uh, other people who believed in you. Okay, they knew you did it, uh, uh, did something, and then you had another idea, another aspect. But how? was that what how was it really different from the early ventures to uh, to now i mean the early ventures as you said also it was fun you were a student and so on uh, uh business wasn't really uh, on the on the table always but here on the one hand even though the concept is more than valuable i mean valuable in the sense that it's uh, a concept uh, you have to believe in and uh, you believe in the kindness of the world and but it's also business because you have people behind you and who give you the resources to do it they do it okay maybe a, a certain percentage of kindness but the other percentage they also want to see a result of it i guess how how did that change you or your co-founders in going into the venture so um, f first off, to, to clarify, really, from, from the very beginning, um, th there wasn't a co-founder at the very early days. Um, we actually added Clemente later on as a, as a co-founder as well. Um, but so 
as, as I said, when, when the idea came up in December 2018, around that time, and between January and August, there was obviously a lot of time that, uh, that I had to be dedicating to, to this venture as well. So um, that means what happened? Well, obviously coming up with a financial plan, thinking about what could the business model look like, thinking about the market research, because it was known to us that this venture could not survive only in Luxembourg. It needed to go outside and international from the very beginning, basically. Uh, and we really wanted to use uh, Luxembourg as this test market for which we always marketed as well, right? An easy way, easy communication where you can go to people, talk to them, present it. If people agree on that and you can do it in all those different languages that we speak, you are basically ready to go international. Um, and that's that's really what, what happened. Signing on, doing letter of intents with several partners, companies that would be willing to, to be working with us. Really, really proud to be saying today that one of those uh, companies was actually Fisher. Fisher was one of the first ones that believed in this and that said, hey, this is a cool idea. Let's try this out. And basically only with wireframes. So a wireframe, just to explain to, to the audience, is literally, well, a sketch. You draw up a sketch and you show them this is what it could look like. So you need to use a lot of imagination as well as to what could this be, right? And so uh, that worked out rather rather, um, rather rapidly. And I was, I was really... Uh, humbled as well by the experience to be talking to all those different people and focus groups that we organized, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, then in, in August, we actually went from the um, from the low fidelity wireframes, as you call them, really sketches into proper designs, organized more um, focus groups, inviting people to the office, consumers as well as companies saying, hey, look at this. What do you think? Should we place the button left or right? Like all those kind of questions that you that you raise in order to to focus on the user experience. And that's how Giftable really came to be. So it really changed in all the preparation work, taking six months really to going deep diving for 14, 15, 16 hours a day, really focusing on what has been done already previously, what can we learn from, from other people, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's all documented. You really just need to take the time to research it. Okay, thank you. And I guess also, as it was on the other level, uh, you also had to take on board other resources. When I say resources, not fina only financial, but human resources, operational resources. It was another kind of game. And how did you uh, live that one? Okay, you had an exit, but was, as you said yourself, it's a little bit more fun. It was more fun. And then uh, we were happy to have, have an exit and uh, to get something back for, for what we did. But here it was, here it is really saying, okay, uh, now we need to level up. And how did you go about it? Uh, did you increase the team? How about hiring, finding resources? As you said, you started here in Luxembourg and uh, Luxembourg is perfect as a test bed for anything you like, uh, not only for the, uh, the languages, but depending also on the technologies you are, uh, in which county do you have a mobile network where can you test it on five different mobile networks? I mean, uh, not only the national ones, but also international ones. You just go drive two hours and you have another mobile network. So that, I mean, that's it. It's really a test bed. But how did you approach that part? That's so, yeah, abs no, I, I absolutely, um, I, I get it. Um, so um, given, given the experience that I had working with the... Uh, creative agency when I was, uh, well, when we sold individual, uh, I learned a hell lot as well, because uh, I went into consulting myself uh, with that company for, for one of, well, several of the biggest employers that we have in Luxembourg. So all of a sudden, I actually gained also the experience of how corporates work and like, what, what, what's it really like to be doing one PowerPoint after the other in order for people to understand and to see what, what the idea is. That was, uh, that was a big one and it really helped uh, moving forward. Then, during my time at uh, at the agency, it was also all about well recruiting and finding the right resources in order to be placing them as consultants with employers. So on that note, I learned a lot. Although I came sort of out of the recruitment industry, so we learned a lot about the recruitment industry with individual, used that in practical terms with the agency, and now I actually knew what works, what doesn't work, how to make a proper offer, the contracts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I could implement that immediately within the new company as well. Um, from there. Uh, I was really lucky as well that um, working out of Silver Square, as you know, our our esteemed um, co-working space in, in Luxembourg City, 
um, I was actually sitting at a table with, well, a hat hunter. And I didn't really know that he was a hat hunter because he was uh, moving forward with another project where he was more about marketing and a marketer. And so we got to talking and obviously we talked for weeks and months and hours on end. And um, basically, given that he wanted to be going from the hat hunting scene more into being a marketer of his uh, products, I actually asked him for help as well to be finding uh, profiles for what we were looking for. And so Stefan, actually great guy. We found a, a super deal that was awesome for him in order to be continuing down the road that he wanted to and helping me in order to be finding the right talent for this venture as well. So at the very beginning, um, we hired, uh, well, develop boss. So we needed a, a development team uh, of four people to, to getting everything up and running. And then uh, I was lucky enough to be, um, well, to having a network and knowing people that actually were looking for a new business development challenge. So we were able to bring on, uh, to me, to this day, still of one of the best business developers that I know in, in, in Luxembourg as to approachability, et cetera, and whatnot. Um, and then obviously it was also about the networks of the employees that we used in order to be finding new employees because it's all about culture, right? It's all about our people, well, nice to each other. We obviously have our values. We didn't write them down like you would see at a big corp where you have all the different values written down. But I knew that if we have the core team together and we needed to be adding people to that, well, obviously you rely on people that have the same values as yourself. It's a sociological fact, right? And so that actually brought in then different talents. And this is how we continued growing the company. Okay, great. So uh, it's a lot about the local knowledge, the people you meet, the team and so on. But how was it about the market? Okay, the market research is one thing. Okay, Having the buy-in of mentors, like the ones you mentioned, is another thing. But now on the street itself, uh, how was the exception, uh, the acceptance, sorry, the acceptance of Giftable and uh, the service you are offering? Was it uh, a little bit like expected or was it really where you said, oops, that's something different and then you immediately pivoted? How, how was that? Absolutely. So, I mean, that we, we, can, we can get a lot of feedback from those focus groups and inviting people to really be showing them the product pre, pre-release pre and whatnot. What is super funny to us, or to me especially, because given, given that Giftable, the nature of the business, where it's all about giving to somebody else, but the idea, and this is just an example, was, well, I'm going to select someone that I'm going to send a gift to, because I'm obviously have the, I'm, I'm having the, the intent of gifting someone really specific. So if I'm choosing you, for example, out of my contacts, and you have the app already, that means that I know what your preferences are because those have been uh, set up at the very beginning when you signed up. And so from there, I could actually be tailor tailoring gifts that I would see because, well, the app could tell me that Steve likes to go for a massage or likes the coffee at XYZ brand, right? Turns out... That's not the case at all. People actually want to go and browse through the catalog first. They come across something and due to that fact, they say, oh, this would be great for Steve, which is completely like to me, it was weird to be experiencing this because it wasn't expected at all. It wasn't expected at all. Turns out, apparently, that's because the gifts we do, um, we do them based on what we like ourselves because we want the other person to get an interest in what we like as well. It's super funny uh, that if you go um, into, again, sociolo uh, sociology, um, the economy of gift giving has never been analyzed until the year 1987. Super interesting, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that we've been doing for years, hundreds of years, that we are providing for others, we are gifting, we are sharing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yet sociology failed to analyze this until 1987. Mm -hmm. And so basically, if you look for, for books, on that uh, phenomenon of gifting, well, you will be rather impressed by how little uh, uh, literature there actually is on that topic. Mm -hmm. So, so that was the, the, this was one of the things. And then obviously going to the market and seeing that, analyzing it based on user behavior, what's happening in the app, et cetera, et cetera, having statistics going down the funnel, really analyzing, okay, what do the numbers tell us? If we do this switch, this change, will the number increase, won't it increase? So really being data-driven helped a lot. And I mean, we were able to uh, to be going to 
close to 11,000, 12,000 users within seven, seven to eight months. Um, and well, 10,000 people in Luxembourg, it's a number, right? It's, it's something. And if you consider then the um, small, ultimately, resources that we have in order to be doing uh, digital marketing and the marketing initiatives that we've, uh, that we've done, um, it was really great to actually, well, I'm proud to say that today, uh, from the digital marketing initiatives that we did on socials, we basically captured 10% market share, which is crazy. If you consider it into our actual target mm -hmm. market, Luxembourgish numbers, which would be 311,000, we would be saying we have 3.11% market share or something around those lines, which is still fascinating to be saying that within like six to well nine months, I would say. Mm -hmm. And so, the yeah, other, the analysis. And the other thing is that there are... I, just take try to integrate the questions uh, which are popping up here. Uh, the, the other thing is, okay, you were talking about the data. And nowadays, the intellig intelligence you have, the data you have either on your profiles, either on what your clients would like to offer, I mean, you have a huge intelligence, and I guess that's yours. That belongs to a giftable. So obviously, we are we are capturing data, and then we, with that data, need to be need to be really smart on how to utilize it, right? Um, the the biggest challenge, and I can openly say it because it's something that would actually be it's nerve wracking, and I think nobody can actually uh, come up with the solution. And if somebody does, please contact me. I would be happy to talk. Um, the the interesting thing is that. I, while, I, while I do have data on the sender mainly, I most likely never have the information on the recipient because I cannot mind control you. I don't know when you would actually be in need of sending a gift to a third person, which is a third dimension into the equation, right? So probably I can trigger you to be doing something, but I don't know necessarily for whom unless that person is sent off as well and it's their birthday or we have different triggers left and right. Mm -hmm. But let's assume this. Uh, I don't know if you have children, but let's assume your children are graduating. Well, how, how are we at Giftable supposed to know that your children are graduating and it would be a cool idea to now be doing a gift for them? We can't know that. Mm -hmm. At least now we can't, right? And so this three-dimensional, this second degree step is really where we are trying to wrap our head around now to be figuring out how we could be uh, stimulating that demand as well. Okay, thank you. And then there are come questions cropping up a little bit in relationship to the revenue model or the service tiers. Is uh, some uh, is it a B two B model? Is it a B two C model? Is it B two B two C model? Um, how would you position it? Uh, Sure. So um, in, in regards to that, at the very beginning, we considered this a B2B2C model, uh, exactly like that. Um, even, even a step further, a B2B2C2C model, mm -hmm. because ultimately our business is uh, taking on partners, which is the B2B part. But ultimately, it's the consumer to consumer. So you sending a gift to, uh, to one of your, your close networks or other networks in general terms, um, which is the C2C part. Um, how is the business uh, model? Well, right now, the business model is really focused on commissions. Uh, although, um, as, as you know, as you are aware of, we just uh, did a pretty cool deal with one of the biggest uh, agent, travel agencies across uh, the world, which will allow us to also switch up to a certain extent the business model where we are direct to consumer, uh, although it's still on the gifting part of things, but it's direct to consumer um, where it's still a commission-based business model behind it, uh, but still the Top line metric actually changes. It's not about GMV, so uh, gross merchandise volume, which is happening over the platform, but it's really about us collecting money and then paying the paying the partner as a distribution service. And uh, there was the question about the partners. I mean, your business partners and so on. I guess it's you also have to make a selection on the the B partners who are on your platform in order to have the credib credibility, to have the quality, to have a certain awareness, notoriety. Uh, how do you deal with that? Or is that would that be a luxury problem? So um, I must admit, it's not really a luxury problem. Um, I actually, uh, with, my, with my business development team, we always said you have the free power to be deciding on who we want or who we are going to have on the platform. However, Here's the limitation. We really want to go about experiences. 
Um, why though? And it's obviously a question that always pops up and I'm, 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 I'm going to elaborate on it uh, just shortly. Um, I really do believe that experiences have way more emotional value than a materialistic gift, a material gift. Um, I mean, I can, I can give you a book and you can read it and you can actually enjoy reading that book and you would probably say, oh yeah, that's a gift that I got from, from Mike. But if I'm gifting you the experience of jumping out of an airplane and doing a parachute jump, that one emotion during the jump will always be linked to the thrill that you had by getting the gift from me. I'm always using the example because that's something that I personally love to give. It's a concert ticket. The concert ticket is really like, if I know that you are a metalhead and you like to uh, listen to Motorhead, for example, and I know they're coming to Luxembourg and I'm gifting you this gift. Well, there will obviously be the celebration of your, let's say, birthday, for example. You will enjoy receiving the gift. Now you have this whole anticipa anticipation time, right? Like three months, six months, nine months, a year probably, where you are just like, you're waiting for that one concert. It's the group you want to you wanna listen to. You really, you appreciate it. And then at the, in, in the best case scenario, at the day and time of the concert, you will have the time of your life. And this moment, those one and a half to two hours, this, this emotion will always be linked to me actually gifting this to you because I was the one enabling you to do so. And if that's not the actual power of showing that people are getting closer together and being more connected on a deeper level than just sending you a hey message or like whatever, right? It's, it, it goes way deeper. And that, like, that's the beauty of gifting. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, uh, there's now uh, also other parts is, okay, it's gifting, offering something, and then it is, okay, how do you get a return do you, uh, in order to know, because you just said, okay, how will I know that you have an incentive, you as a client, a customer have an incentive to make a gift to somebody else you don't know? But the other thing is, uh, how do you also have the feedback loop on, okay, this person has received the gift, on how it worked out, if that was the right gift, and uh, if yes, do we give it back to the gifter? Uh, so, um, yes and no. Uh, it's a, it's a two-sided question there, basically. Yeah, of course. Um, so ob obviously if, if the recipient actually goes and redeems that gift, because we obviously also have those that are receiving it and not, re not redeeming, that obviously tells us something in the statistics, right? So if the next person wants to gift something, we could actually say, hey, this is probably not that good of an idea to be sending. On the other hand side, we have the, uh, the reviews, right? So you are going to redeem something, you can review it, you can say, hey, this was great, this wasn't great, this uh, was the best experience of my life, which will obviously tell other gifters that you as a giftee enjoyed the experience. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we, however, are not um, giving you the possibility to, um, to, to be giving that feedback specifically to the sender. However, we are opening up the communication channel. That means that we have a messaging platform in included, integrated, where you and I could be chatting. Because if I'm gifting you on a platform, I don't necessarily want you to be switching to Messenger, WhatsApp, Vibe, or whatever the other platform is, to be telling me, hey, thank you, this is amazing, right? And so we integrated that, that you can actually exchange on those messages, say, hey, this was an amazing experience, send something back in return as well, because, I mean, it's all about reciprocity, right? We want people to be gifting each other and not only giving, giving, giving and not receiving from time to time as mm -hmm. well. We as a platform also have that sort of uh, within, our, within our mission. Um, if you right now are participating in either one of the campaigns that we are launching, for example, also the platform gifts you. Um, so let's say you send out three muffins uh, well, you will actually be getting one muffin in return as well, because we want you to have the experience too. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, the, uh, now the time is running out because it's ma marvelous. And I just go through the questions if uh, we have tackled everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the, the, uh, the questions a little bit more to the end is how do you, how do you see giftable evolve and how would you like it evolve or what would the impact you would like to give with giftable i mean you don't have to answer all the questions but it's a little bit on forward looking um, uh, on the giftable uh, how you see it evolving yeah absolutely so um where, where, where do i see this company going 
Um, considering this uh, this travel agency deal where we now all of a sudden have a major supply of uh, of gifts, um, we actually can have an impact at least within the short term. So I'm talking about the next three months on the whole European Union, which is already tremendous. I mean, if we as a European Union can actually become a union on a human level, then we've done like the, I've achieved everything that, that that I set out to do, at least for the European Union. Now, in, in a best case scenario, an app like Giftable would not need to exist because with our big vision of bringing people closer together, if we were all closer together, well, Giftable wouldn't, wouldn't, there wouldn't be a requirement for it, right? There wouldn't be a market for it either. Well, probably just because it's tech, um, but, but that's that. Um, so I, I really would love to see that in terms of the bigger picture. Now, in terms of the team, um, currently we, uh, we are still a team of six people, seven people uh, that, that are working out of Luxembourg. Uh, we were at some point now nine, but we had two people actually uh, leaving the company recently due to well personal uh, decisions that we're taking, which is fine. Um, so do do we want to grow the team? Well, obviously, it will be a requirement as well. We obviously need to grow the team. Um, we are uh, required to have the human capacities working with us and also well, brain power, because it's really, there are challenges that may sound ridiculous, to, like if you think about them, but they are really, really difficult. And we are actually solving big problems here. Like, as I explained, the, the second degree gifting for a company, a tech company like ours, it's really difficult. And so um, uh, that, that's basically where I want to see the company go, really going into the European Union, unifying the human closeness, human, uh, human behavior, nudging them into the right direction, doing the right thing. Um, and, and actually try and, and put an example forward as to being being the better human beings that we can be. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Michel, for joining us and uh, sharing with us your, uh, how shall I say, experience, but also your journeys you have uh, undertaken. And also thank you to you, dear viewers, listeners, and wishing you an, uh, a good the rest of the day, evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, Steve.